Good morning, City Gate. You know, I'm excited to, uh, you know, continue this series that we've started. It's called Shadows. But before I kind of lay the foundation for this new step, this Sunday is an all-in Sunday. That means that we are going to go do baptisms today out at the beach, I believe about five, and we have 16 people going to be baptized today. Can somebody say amen? You know, we started with faith this morning because we looked at the weather forecast and once again, we've, we've actually postponed because of weather twice. And they said, oh, pastor, it's like, it started this morning at 70%. Now it's at 50%, but it's going down. It's 40%. I said, rain or shine, we are not postponing this thing one more minute. I said, we are going to baptize. They're going to get wet anyway. Um, but we're going to have some hamburgers and some stuff if you want to join us. Um, and, you know, most of the time we start with 16, end up about 20 or 25 that want to get baptized by the end of uh, the, the moment of opportunity. And we're excited about that. And there's a lot of faith there because I told first service, I said, if it starts to rain, we're going to go to my house. We're going to do it in the pool. Michelle said, no, no, it's not going to rain. I'm going to speak that right now. Um, you know. <laughs> so... Uh, we're, we've got a prophet talking to the Lord about not, it not raining, so we're going to uh, do that. You know, I want to give an incredible shout out to our worship team. You know, Thursday we had um, some technical challenges. Um, we actually called a company to come in Friday. Uh, David come and met them here, and they thought they had it all worked out. And sure enough, it worked Friday, Friday afternoon, and then this morning started happening again. That's what technology does. And on top of that, Pastor Matt called. He had to have some emergency dentistry uh, done this morning. Um, the bulb in our, our projector went out. We got a call from uh, Miss Mary, as Pastor has alluded to. Uh, it, it's just been a moment full of challenges, and how I um, really process those things is that I believe that this is a message that God wants you to hear. And the enemy has done everything he could to try to distract my mind. And um, so I asked first service to pray with me and I'm going to ask you to pray with me as well. We had four people, I believe it was, that got saved in first service. So we're really excited about that. And also, uh, you know, if you haven't signed up for Trunk or Treat, please do so. You could do that on the app or do it back there with Miss Dawn uh, when you pick up the kids uh, from children's ministry. But would you pray with me? Father, today I am so thankful that you've placed on my heart a message to preach that I believe come from, from your heart. And that, God, that we saw you do incredible things in first service, and we believe that you're going to do that much or more even in our second service. So God, help me to put away every distraction and that God, right now, let's focus on what you are doing right now, right here among the lives of your people. I give you praise for an anointing that goes beyond what I can do in my own capabilities, but God, I pray for the, the anointing and the unction from the Holy Spirit that allows me to communicate your word with fervency and with passion. And I give you the praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Well, let's get everybody caught up. We started a series called Shadows, and it really has to do with fear. And we started with uh, the subject of fear concerning the, uh, a man named Joshua. Joshua was about to take the responsibility. He was going to follow a great leader, and he was going to go over into the promised land and fight a battle that militarily he was not supposed to win. They had no weapons that could break down walls, but yet God told him he was going to give them the promised land, and he gave them instructions. And, but during that first sermon, we established what happened was God in the first, book of, uh, first chapter of the book of Joshua comes to Joshua and says, be strong and courageous. And there was a reason why he could be strong and courageous. He said, for I am with you. As I was with Moses, I shall be with you. And so we found that there was a connection to that statement in the book of First John that said, perfect love cast out fear. Well, when in the context of that chapter, perfect love was the knowledge that God would go with you even unto death. All the way, or not to death, he will be with you during death, but all the way to judgment. And if God will be with us all the way to judgment, my goodness, that we can have a confidence to believe in a faith that he, we are never alone, we're never facing the challenges of life alone, and that with the knowledge that he is with us brings us peace instead of fear. 
And it cast out our curious fear. Last week, we talked about Gideon. Now, Gideon was an incredible story because most of you think you know the story of Gideon, but there's a lot of truth in there that kind of gets glossed over because we rush to the 300 men fighting this innumerable army. But what happens is, is when God meets Gideon, he's a coward. He's hiding in a cave. He's got him a little bit of scraps of wheat, and he's trying to beat it on a rock, trying to keep the Midianites from getting it. Angel shows up and says, oh, you mighty man of valor. He says, man, you've got the wrong guy. I'm I'm just like, I'm as scared as everybody else. He said, matter of fact, I'm the least of the least. You've got the wrong man. He said, no, we got the right person. And this is how we're gonna start establishing your courage and breaking the culture of fear. We're gonna allow you to get your worship right. And he said, before I can trust you, or before you can trust me with keeping your life on a battlefield, let's try saving your life among your family. He said, I want you to go tonight, and I want you to tear down all the idols of your father. I want you to tear down the idols. I want you to cut down the Asherah pole, chop it up into pieces, and use the Asherah pole for firewood to burn the idol up. Well, of course, the next morning, Gideon's family wants to kill him. His father intervenes and says, wait a minute, this may be the start of revival. They blow a, a horn to call the men of war together. 32,000 men show up. And I talked about fear and what it would take because I would rather die in my pride <laughs> than to tell everybody I'm afraid. And so God says, you got too many people, Gideon. If you go with 32,000, I know there's more than you can count over on the other side, and it it would still be a miracle, but you would think that it was because of your courage, your power, your military prowess that caused, tell, tell, just ask them a question. Say, anybody that's afraid, go home. 22,000 men said, okay, God bless, I'm out. So he still has 10,000 against an innumerable army, and God shows up again and says, "Uh, by the way, you've got too many. Do the drink test thing. He ends up with 300. We know the story, but the incredible part before the battle is is that he started to get afraid again. And I wanted to remind you that courageous people are not absent of fear. No, they acknowledge the fear and they face it anyway. There's never a person's life that is going to be free from the absence of fear. Sometimes you're just going to have to face the thing that you're afraid of. And so he tells Gideon, he said, if you're still afraid, sneak over to the camp. And if you're afraid to do that, take somebody with you. So he got a friend, went over there. And sure enough, he heard people of the enemy's army talking and saying, God has delivered us into the hand of Israel through the mighty hand of Gideon. And I never want you to let the enemy keep you from your identity of knowing that once you break the chain of fear, you can do extraordinary things with God. So today we're going to talk about the greatest underdog story in the history of mankind. David versus Goliath, shepherd boy versus a giant, giants eight foot plus tall. And I'm going to read a passage of scripture that is going to give you some details because some of you may think you know about this story. But we're going to talk about this story based on the foundation of what are you going to choose to be, courageous and faithful or fearful. Let's turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm going to put on my glasses. They're going to stick up that verse starting in verse 24. And it says, all the men of Israel, when they saw the man talking about Goliath, fled from him and were much afraid. There we go. And the men of Israel, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. While you're looking at that on the screen, I want you to notice there's going to be two perspectives. The people in the army think he's there to defy the army. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his his father's house free in Israel. And David said to the men who stood by him, what shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that should defy the armies of the living God? See, David, his perspective is that the giant was defying God, not defying the armies. And and the people answered him in the same way, so shall it be done to the man who kills him. Now, Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption. 
and the evil in your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Was it not but a word? Look at your neighbor and say, was it but a word? And he turned away from him towards another and spoke in the same way, and the people answered him again as before. And when the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are not able uh, to go against the Philistine. You are uh, to fight with him for you are but a youth. And he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of, the, out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears. Look at your neighbor again. Say lions and bears. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them. And for he has defied the armies of the living God. One more verse. And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Let's pray one more time. Father, honor your word today. And I ask for that anointing once again to be upon me to speak with clarity in Jesus' name. And everybody said, See, most of us rush to David swinging his sling and those five smooth stones. We'll get to that in a little bit. Did you realize that by the time David got there, does anybody even know why David was even there in the first place? He was bringing a sack lunch on behalf of his father to his brothers that were close enough that he could walk to the battlefield. Inside of that sack lunch was a few loaves of bread and a little bit of cheese. He's about 17 to 18 years of age. He is probably at least two years removed from Samuel anointing him as king of Israel. And now he's come armed with a bag lunch, just on an errand for his father to go honor his brothers that served in the military. On this day, you have to remember, for 39 days previous, let's pretend this building is is the spot. And we've got the building is the valley. It's that place in between two mountains where battles are won, where one army fights another army on pretty much flat ground. But they camp on top of the high country so they could have the advantage of sight. So you got saying on this wall where there's a mountain, you got the armies of Israel. On this wall, you've got up on top of the mountain, you've got the armies of the Philistines. And they would, for 39 days, they would get their armor together. They would move towards the valley to fight a traditional battle. But what would happen is an eight foot tall plus man would come to the the center of the valley and with a booming voice. So now he's in this place that he don't even need a microphone. It's incredible because, you know, he's got this booming voice. He's eight foot tall for goodness sakes. And he says, why should we risk the lives of all of these men? You send one guy and we'll fight mano y mano, man to man. And if he kills me, we'll serve you. If I kill him, you serve us. Let's put the swords away. And for 39 days, there had not been a single man in the army of Israel that would break the bondage of fear and with courage and faith go face this giant. Because there's a difference, folks, and I've got to preach here for just a moment so I could teach effectively. What has happened in modern church a lot of times is modern church has some wonderful aspects. We've got the ability to go on the internet and broadcast the gospel globally in an instant. That's wonderful. We've got technology. we got lights. For goodness sakes, we've taken tubs and put light bulbs in them and cooled up the stage it's nice I've got a microphone to preach we got air conditioning can somebody say amen Amen. but what we've done sometimes in the vehicle of convenience is we've got you accustomed to knowing about God 
instead of knowing him. So what happens is, is that we worship with a team that sings on stage on Sunday. But if the only time you do what you did this morning so passionately, man, you are losing an opportunity to see the presence of God in your own vehicle, in your own living room, in your own house. Because if you could live on 20 minutes of worship a week, come tell me how. And then we, we trust men and women to come and break apart Scripture and preach to us. And we value the going forth of Scripture and the power of an anointing that God places in the hearts and lives of men and women that preach the gospel. But my job is not for me to bring you revelation. It's to bring you confirmation. It's to let you know that it's not enough for me to come tell you my experiences with God because I've spent time with him. No, it's for me to encourage you to spend time with God and that by the time we get back together next week, you know enough about him that you're amening because when I'm talking about God whispering your name, you can say, I heard it this week, pastor. You don't have to tell me he'll whisper my name. I heard him whisper my name. Because we have a whole army that knew about God, but none of them had intimacy with him. You've got Saul, the king, present in the company of the army. He's a head, according to scripture, he's a head taller than any man in Israel. So he's six foot probably plus, tallest man in Israel, and he's cowering because of the giant. But on this occasion, on the 40th day, Big guy messes up because he is going to run into a young man that doesn't know about God. He's been singing to him in a field. He has fellowshiped with him. He has wrote songs to him. He has seen God accomplish things through him that was humanly impossible to accomplish. You got a guy hearing the voice of a giant with a different attitude. They're thinking he's defying the armies and saying, I'm better than you at at hand-to-hand combat. This dude walks up carrying a sack lunch, by the way, just to give it to his brothers and says, hey, who is that screaming down there in the valley? I got issue with him because he's not defying the nation of Israel. He's defying our God. And isn't somebody going to do something about it? He's like, hey, uh, by the way, what happens if somebody kills that dude? Well, they get rich. They get the daughter of the king. And in that scripture, it says they are free in Israel. Does anybody know what that means? No taxes. Let's modernize this sermon for a moment. Any of you know David Pleasant Sr.? Say amen. Amen. He is conservative concerning his financial resources. That brother will save a penny. He will squeeze out a penny and turn a dollar in. He'll just, he, he is a stewardship, incredible man of God. And if I call my dad and I said, hey, dad, guess what? I'm down here in the army. I was up here visiting Jim, and he's fighting in the army. And, and um, there's a big guy down here. And you know what I heard? I heard that the man that kills this dude, he gets rich and he gets to marry the daughter of the king and his father's house never has to pay taxes again. My dad would say, may God be with you, son. (laughs) That sounds like God's moving. There's revival in the land. Go encourage my brother. Go kill that giant Dave. Sure. But did you ever notice that the moment that you're ready to break the chain of fear, there's always somebody telling you you can't? And, and, and here's a good teaching moment. I'm going to be honest with you today. You can hurt my feelings. My feelings have been hurt a thousand times. More than that. But you cannot offend me. See, I believe offense is a choice. And when you choose to be offended, you are so messed up because you've got offended because somebody didn't agree with you. You lose the moment of killing the giant. 
is that you're so mad that everybody wasn't gung-ho about your idea that you get your feelings hurt and God's up there going, there's a giant to kill. Quit worrying about what that brother has to say. Because soon as he decides to, because what people want to do, especially if they're challenged with fear, they want you to be just as afraid as they, as they are. So it doesn't highlight their fear because it's hard to find when a whole army's afraid, it's hard to point out just one person. This dude shows up, his brother, which Samuel thought was going to be the next king of Israel because he was a military man. His brother hears his 17-year-old kid. I can understand because sometimes kids talk big noise, right? Especially, guys, amen me. When you're, if you ever raise a son and they get to be like 15 years old and they start talking in that voice like a man and you're like, I will kill you. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm sure that that was a little bit about what Eliab had to deal with. And he was like, hey, little boy, we're people of war here. Even though we're not fighting, we're afraid of this dude. We're people of war here. And we kind of gotten comfortable over 39 days of listening to this guy. Nobody's died yet. That's an indictment right there. Should have been, the story should have went, there's 39 men that have died fighting this dude every day that he's done this. But nobody showed up yet. And where, by the way, they will always, when they're criticizing what you could do, they're always going to remind you of your shortcomings from your past. Hey, by the way, where's your little sheep? Who's watching your little sheep? That's your job. Let me put you back in your identity as the little boy watching a few sheep. Just go back to doing that, by the way, and quit embarrassing us. David does not get offended over his brother. Matter of fact, it says like he doesn't even pay attention to him. He just goes to the next guy and says, hey, what th- he told me what happens. You tell me again. What happens to the guy that kills him? I get rich. I marry the king's daughter. My dad don't have to pay no more taxes. Okay. And, and by the way, tell somebody in charge, I want to speak to somebody that has some authority. They hear, it's not hard to find courage among fearful men. Can you imagine Saul? Saul hears the rumblings in the camp. Somebody's ready to fight Goliath. He said, bring him to me. Takes the pressure off of me. (laughs) They've been waiting for the king to fight the whole time. They just didn't know that there was a new king. They didn't know that he had oil from a living room that hadn't yet been publicized yet. But But the army had a king in the camp. It just wasn't the one in the tent. He said, bring him to it. Now, can you imagine you're this military king and this, they tell you, oh, there's a guy ready to fight Goliath. Okay, bring him to me. And in walks this 17-year-old kid. I'm here. Brought my brother some lunch today. <laughs> yeah, I know I ain't got no military garb on, man. I'm just a shepherd. But I love David. Because David speaks through his relationship with God. He starts to speak as if he knows more of the intimate relationship than knowing about the legend of God. He starts coming in and and, and Saul, if you think that the enemy is only going to send one person to tell you you can't do something, then you are are challenged in what your thinking is because he's going to send person after person. This is the second person that is going to tell David it's impossible for him to do what he thinks he can do. He said, son, come on in. God bless you. That always scares me. When people start patting you on the back and go, God bless you. They're fixing to tell you why you can't do something. And he just starts, God bless you, brother. You are so courageous. But man, you're a kid. You can't defeat this guy. He's been in the army longer than you've been alive. He is a man of war. Have you seen him? He's eight foot tall. And the Bible gives you scriptural dimensions of his armor. Everything that they list is bigger than David. His spear is bigger than David. (laughs) And he tells him, God bless you, but man, you can't fight this guy. He said, oh, no, king. You look at me. 
as a shepherd. But let me tell you a story. I was a shepherd in a field outside of Bethlehem. See, I want us to lay a foundation. Why would a kid fight a lion or a bear? What do you think killed Goliath? Somebody, if they spoke out loud, say, a rock. No, a rock didn't kill Goliath. A rock knocked him out. Some would say, well, his own sword, because after he knocked him out, David went and got his own sword and cut his head off. They said, well, the sword killed him. Nah, I think a word killed him. You say, what are you talking about, a word? See, in chapter 16, David was 15 or 16. And the prophet of prophets, the prophet Samuel, shows up at a door. See, Samuel was not an obscure prophet. If I was going to name an obscure prophet, I'd say, somebody tell me what Obadiah prophesied. You would say, who? How about Zephaniah? I don't know. But Samuel, you can connect with Samuel. Samuel was the man. Samuel was that kid that took over for Eli, remember, in the temple? He's that guy that God spoke directly to. Everybody knew Samuel. Samuel was famous. Hey, Jesse, here to anoint God. I know we've got to be a little discreet about this, but God said Saul's kingdom is coming to an end, and I'm here to anoint the next king. Old man walks in carrying a horn of oil, a jar of oil. He says, okay, send in your sons. Eliab comes first. He's the military guy. Samuel stands up, says, oh, this must be the king. He looks like the king. Holy Spirit says, don't look on his outside because he ain't the one. Seven sons come in. Now Samuel's a little bit confused going, I know I know the voice of God. He looks at Jesse and says, is this all your kids? He said, oh, no, we got the youngest. He's like 15. He's out there watching some sheep. He said, I won't even sit down until he comes in. Bible says he was ruddy, beautiful eyes, handsome young man. Smelling like a sheep with rags on. Sheep lowest, or shepherd lowest in the totem pole. He comes bouncing in like, hey, dad, I heard you call for me. What's up? Holy Spirit said, that's him. Old man gets up. Now, Samuel's old by this point. Ham probably, I'm 53. My hand shakes a little bit. And he takes that oil and says, I've heard from the Lord that you, as he's pouring the oil over his head, and it's coming down his hair, soaking his garment that still is a shepherd garment, not the robes of a king. And he says, you are declared by God, not by me, but by God, to be the next king of Israel that will sit on the throne of Israel. You know what his first job is as king? Go back to being a shepherd. 15 years old now, he's wet with oil. He looks like a shepherd. He smells like a king. He goes back out there to the field, and this is what gets you encouraged, is that here comes a lion and a bear. Look at your neighbor and say, lion and bears. You know, they never try to kill David. I believe wholeheartedly the enemy is trying to set up a, a principle in David's life that will kill him at the end. See, and he never takes a sheep. He only takes a lamb, a little thing, the smallest in the flock. Because he knew if he could establish a principle, if David would look the other way with little things in the shepherd field, he would look the other way when he's sitting on the throne as a king and little things will turn into big things and take your kingdom away. Bible said, no, not this kid. He said one of two things. Either God's a liar. Mm, let that sink in. Our old man was crazy. Let's talk about God being a liar. You know it's impossible for God to lie. I'm going to read a, a scripture in the book of Hebrews to you. Listen to this. For, God went, for when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself. 
saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise for people swear by something greater than themselves in all their disputes. An oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show his more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of our soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. What God was doing is saying, I stood up, the writer of Hebrews is saying, God stood up one day and swore swore by himself to a 99-year-old man that he would have the heirs and descendants as the sand of the sea and the stars of heaven. And this 99-year-old man grabbed hold of a word that he was promised by the voice in the lips of God. And he held on to that, believing that God could perform it. And we know God did because he said, there's two unchangeable things. If God said it, it can anchor my soul. And if God said, it, it is impossible for him to lie. It is not impossible for God to lie because he's not, doesn't have bad character. His sovereign voice cannot lie. He stood out in the midst of darkness, looking at darkness. Now that's factual and said, let, there wasn't even no light around other than his glory and said, let there be light. And in the midst of darkness at 186,000 miles per second, the glory of God started crushing the darkness before him and separated light and darkness at that moment because he said it. You said, that's good preaching stuff, pastor. Let's get practical. If God told you the sky was orange, it's not factual according to yesterday's uh, knowledge. But if God stood up today and said the sky is orange, we would walk out of this building from the moment he said it. And guess what? The sky would be orange because of the sovereignty of his voice. You can anchor your soul to a word. That's why a kid could go find a lion or a bear and say, you know what? Let's do some self-evaluation. I remember the story of Abraham. My father's 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 told it to him and told it to me. And he believed God could do anything because God said at 99, he could have a son and that son would have a, a, a son and that son would have a son. Sand of the sea, stars of heaven. I had an old man, a prophet, not some fly by night guy. I had Samuel dump oil on my head. I still smelled the oil telling me that I'm supposed to be the next king. David, have you sat on the throne yet? No. So if that bear kills me, God is a liar. So I'm going to stand on the word that God said that I would be the next king of Israel and I'm going to go grab the bear. If the bear does not cooperate, this is what's so incredible. What If the bear does not cooperate by giving me the lamb, I will grab it by the chin and tear it apart. Because in my frail little 15, 16 year old body rest an anointing. Because if you read it closely, when Samuel dumps the oil, it said, and the Holy Spirit rushed upon this little kid. And that little kid become a man of God that could sing in intimate times with God. And no, he didn't sing because somebody told him about killing a bear. He started writing a song. When the bear showed up, the anointing, come on, I smelled the anointing, knew God could not lie and knew that God was a character that I I could anchor my soul in. And so I went and chased down a bear, grabbed it by the face and tore it in two and rescued my lion. He said, that's who's going to fight the giant brother. I got a word. I ain't been king yet. You sitting in my chair and I'm patiently waiting. So I believed the lion couldn't kill me. You can play something, David. I got to quit preaching. The bear couldn't kill me. And I know this giant can't kill me. Now, I asked for service this, and it just happened to do this. I'm kind of an impromptu guy. I said, just pick one, lion or bear. They said, the bear. I said, isn't it ironic that when a bear stands up, he's about eight foot tall. He said, oh yeah, I faced that guy. That I faced something that tall before. Don't worry about it. I grabbed it by the chin and ripped it in two. I don't look like much. 
Isn't it incredible how we always want the superheroes to show up? I mean, I got a Captain America shirt, shirt, a Thor shirt, a Batman shirt, and a Superman shirt. We always want somebody to fly in and rescue us. Sometimes God knows enough that most of the time we want God to do it for us. God, kill the giant. He can kill the giant. He knows he can kill the giant. He just wants you to know you can too. I've heard preachers preach. Man, they crack me up. Preachers crack me up. I crack myself up. I've heard sermons about the five smooth stones coming from the brook and what they mean. They don't mean a a thing. (laughs) I almost got messed up right there. (laughs) You know what they mean? Smooth stones fly straight. It didn't have any hidden foundations. It didn't have anything like that. He just wanted this, this shepherd kid knew what kind of rock flew straight. He just went to the brook, said, oh yeah, there's one. A little pet shepherd pouch, oh, it'll fit about five. Because they may, after I kill this one, it wasn't because he thought he would miss. He said, after I kill this one, some other one may show up. I got five of them, that's enough, all right. And then he goes, and, and he's walking down towards, finally they tell Goliath, you got, a, you got somebody who's accepted your challenge. We have a champion. Okay. He gets his stuff together, his little armor bearers coming out there carrying his stuff of war. He sets his shield down, and he's booming. Who is this champion of Israel? Out comes this kid, still in his shepherd stuff, still smelling like a king. He laughs and says, this is the best you got? You're sending me a child to do a man's job? David never even bats eye. He said, oh, brother, man, you're another one messing up. You, you evaluate me from my outside. See, you think that you are, are intimidating the army, which you've caused for 39 days to have fear. But on this 40th day, we're going to celebrate a little victory because you tell me that you are going to feed my flesh to the fowls of the air? Let me tell you something. There's a Holy Spirit inside of me and a God which you have defiled. And I have come on his behalf to be a man of courage that breaks the chain of fear. And I'm going to not only kill you today, but I'm going to feed your flesh to the same birds you said would feed mine. The clash happens. The rock sling hits him in the head, knocks him unconscious. Sword comes out. Bam. No more giant. How many of you waiting for God to do that for you? When he's waiting to do it in you and through you. God kill the giant. God kill the giant. You wake up every day. God kill the giant. God kill the giant. And he's telling you, son or daughter, you have the anointing inside of you. I already know I'm God. The giant knows I can kill him. He doesn't know you can't. Because if I kill him for you, another one will take his place and make you just as fearful. But if you finally take the courage to break the chains of fear, then the next giant that shows up will be another testimony that you could tell them, I faced one just like you. But here's the thing. We're gonna do things a little bit different. We're still gonna give opportunity for people to get saved and healed and all of that stuff today. But we take so much time singing to you. I mean, Dave can do his thing, man. He's like, and then he does some of this. <laughs> Little scissor kick. And, man, <laughs> and that's great stuff, man. And then we take 30 more minutes for somebody to preach to you. But I'm 53 years old. I can't even remember facts anymore. I mean, at 18, I caught a fish. It was 18 inches long. Now it's 42 inches. My my words can only inspire you. They can't be the anchor of your soul. But how many times do we give opportunity for you to hear from God? To get a word that you can live on. Because if I tell you, you're not going to believe me all the time. But if he says it, put it in the bank. Anchor your soul to it. 
Say, giant, I'm coming for you on Monday morning because I got a word on Sunday afternoon that said God is with me and I will not be afraid of you one more day of my life. Oh, I'm going to kill you. You think so? Because if you kill me, God is a liar. And he cannot lie. It's something I anchor my soul to. So what we're going to do is I'm going to pray for about 10 or 15 seconds. And then David's just going to play. And we're going to let virtual silence fall over this place other than that piano playing so you could hear the voice of God tell you who you are and give you the encouragement to face your own giant. Oh, his name may not be Goliath, but he's just as powerful and intimidating in your life. And today is the last day he'll have dominion over you. Father, here we stand, ready to receive a word that we can anchor our soul to. God, we don't need another sermon to inspire us. No, we need a word that can hold us. When life starts to get confusing and the whirlwind of transition happens and it seems like we are going to meet our maker at any moment, I want a word that I could hold on to. I want something that I could anchor my soul to. I don't want somebody else's song. I'd like to have a song of my own. has come from the depths of my heart because you said it. So God, right now, speak to your people in Jesus' name. You may say, Pastor, the word that I got from the Lord seems impossible. Really? How does this sound? 17-year-old kid, 125, 40 pounds, soaking wet with two rocks in his pocket, facing an eight-foot-tall giant, a man of war. But he smelled like a king. And he had a word from God that taught him how to kill a bear, taught him how to kill a lion, and ultimately taught him how to kill a giant. Did you know that this battle catapulted him to fulfill the destiny of the word? Him killing the giants, what made him a king. Everything else before that time was private. When the giant fell, it became public. And the ladies of Israel started singing, Saul has killed his thousands, David his ten thousands. No, he didn't kill 10,000 people. He just killed one big one. It felt like 10,000. Whatever God's telling you to face tomorrow, believe he gave you a word for it today. Face, quit praying for God to kill the giant for you. Start getting empowered by faith and courage to let God partner with you, anoint you. It's his strength that does it, but he wants to do it through you, not for you. He wants you to know you can kill a giant. Father, right now, I thank you for every word that you 
gave into the hearts and lives of your people, that they could break the chain of fear and live a life of courage and faith. Courageous living doesn't mean that we are absent of fear. It means that we see the giants, we see the bears, we see the lions, but we face them anyway, believing that your word will secure us and anchor our soul. So Father, give us victory, testimonies. Let us have courage to pray impossible prayers like Tiny Dickerson having four, uh, stage four cancer and her life seemingly coming to the final chapters. We declare her healing in Jesus' name. We believe in, a, in, a, in an environment like this. We can receive a word. And so, Father, we want that word today. We want to live off of that word. And Father, there's marriages. There's things that are happening in the lives of these people that, Father, giants have tried to intimidate them for years. But, God, they are now hearing a word from the lips of God that says, I've given you the authority and the ability and the unction to face your giant. God, let victory resound. And let us break the chains of fear in Jesus' name. And everybody said, hey, can we do something before we leave? You know, one of the most courageous things is coming to the end of oneself and saying, you know what? I'm not enough. Especially when we're facing things like eternity. And we're thinking, well, God, he wouldn't do things for people like me. Yes, he would. John 3, 16 said, for God so loved the world. Didn't say for God so loved the elect. Didn't say for God so loved perfect people. For God so loved good people. For God so loved people that did good things. He said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, 17 said, he didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but by through him, through Jesus, the world might be saved. That's a word. You may not know Jesus right now and say, did he really die for me? Yes, that's a word. That's something you can anchor your soul to. He died for you. And it comes to a place where we say, you know what? I don't want to walk one more moment alone that scripture tells me that this God that died for me and resurrected from the dead will never leave me nor forsaken nor abandon me. And I don't wanna face my giants alone, they keep winning. But I wanna face the giants of my life with the knowledge of knowing he is with me and that he will never abandon me and he will anoint me to defeat my giants. That sounds like good gospel news, right? So if you are a person that says, I don't have a relationship with God, I've only heard about him. I want to encourage you, the God of Abraham that provided a 99-year-old man with, with children and a God of David that could cause a shepherd to become a king, I wonder what he could do with you. So most of the time, how in the world can I tell everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes after I've preached about facing the giants? Because one of the giants in most people's life is what everybody else is going to think about you. I'm gonna give you an opportunity to raise your hand if you wanna get saved today. And you wanna say, well, pastor, people will judge me. No, they won't. We used to be you. We used to raise, we raised our hand. We come forward. We offered ourselves to the Lord. We surrendered. Repenting is not telling God you're sorry. It's saying I'm tired of that life and turning away from it and becoming a follower of Christ. So you want to feel something really good? The Bible says heaven celebrates when somebody gets saved. I promise you city gate is too. If we see a hand go up in this place, I promise you, you will not, you will be received not by judgment, but by people clapping and celebrating, remembering what they did when they got saved. So if you want to get saved today, everybody's looking at you. We're giants in the, in the house, but you're going to overcome the giants with your faith. Anybody want to get saved today? Just raise, look, there's, a, there's hands going up. Come on. There's hands up there in the balcony. Anybody else want to get saved? Raise your hand high. I see that hand. I see these hands. Face your giant today. I see them. I see those hands. Amen. Let's do one more time. Does anybody else that hasn't raised their hand? Come on, don't miss the moment. Raise the, I see those hands. Now, the 
the important part is that I didn't see them. God saw them and recognizes that as an act of faith right now. The Bible says if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is the Son of God, died for our sins and resurrected, you shall be saved. So if you raise your hand right now, we're going to pray. Can't pray for you, but we're going to pray with you. You just say, Pastor, or you say, God, here I am. I'm yours. I'm going to follow you the rest of my life. I believe in your word. I believe you are who you say you are. And we're going to celebrate one more time. Father, today, as those that raise their hand right now, they're just asking you for the forgiveness of their sins. They're saying, I am a sinner in need of a savior. And right now they are believing your word that for God so loved the world, you gave your only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God, we accept that word right now. We live on that word and we anchor our word. When we say amen, we're gonna find out we're still not perfect, but you sure were. And your grace and your compassion and your mercy is gonna overwhelm our failures. And we are never gonna be anything less than your children. And we give you the praise and honor and glory for being born again and a fresh new start that we are gonna follow you with passion, with all of our heart in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. Let's give the Lord one more praise offering.